Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with Elizabeth Whitlow, the Executive Director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi. Oops, got to put my hand right there. Nice to see you, Aaron. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, and I'm really excited to dive into this conversation with you. It's a very important one. And uh, before I share with folks just a little bit about you and your background, I want to encourage folks to uh, like, uh, subscribe, and follow our podcast on YouTube and on your uh, podcast channel of choice. And uh, yeah, we're going to dive in and talk about regenerative agriculture and the new regenerative organic certification here. So uh, let's, let's dive in. Elizabeth Whitlow's role as the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance is the culmination of over 20 years working for systemic change in agriculture systems. She began her career as an advocate for shade grown fair trade and organic coffee growers in Central America. Since then, she has worked across the spectrum of elevated certifications, both in farming and ranching. She is now leading the charge for regenerative organic agriculture managing the holistic and high bar regenerative organic certified standard. The ROC is the North Star of certifications building upon the USDA organic label through the pillars of soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. Now in the approximately 37 seconds it took for me to read this brief bio, we have lost the equivalent of 18 soccer fields of living topsoil on our planet. And Elizabeth, it feels like that is exactly the right place to kick off our conversation. Can you paint the picture and just tell us a bit about what's going on with soil right now? Yeah, then that's, um, thank you so much for the introduction. And that's why it, that bio ends with that really startling statistic. Like it makes it so tangible for all of us. Like in this little moments that we get to say hello and talk to each other, we're losing field after field of, of topsoil is blowing away and being destroyed due to industrialized agriculture. And so that is really where we can begin. And there's a lot of interest right now in soil, a lot of learning going on. It's a very emergent um, kind of topic where people are coming to this awareness of the fact that we've got more living beings in one teaspoon of soil than we have humans on the planet another startling statistic that is kind of mind boggling when you try to get your head around that, that 85% of those living beings in that one little teaspoon have not yet been identified. And all the different complex interactions that are going on between all these living beings are still to be learned. We have so much to learn about what's going on in the soil. And so I think it's just a really important and um, great kind of starting point on why it is important to farm in a way that preserves the soil what we do to the soil, we do to ourselves, right? It is the bedrock of our civilization and our culture. And um, it's just, you know, I think the time for soil is now. The year, for, the year of soil was a couple of years ago. I don't know if you recall this, but, um, you know, it's only wonky kind of folks like me probably who were paying attention to that. But now it feels like a lot more people are paying attention. And so I'm really grateful for the time to come and talk to your audience. I know your listeners already are so up on all these topics and are probably very well aware of what's going on, but happy to uh, jump in and elaborate on any points. So thanks, Aaron. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and we're all learning together. And it, even if we're hearing something again, I think it really helps us absorb and understand even more deeply uh, when we when we hear additional perspectives on, on these same topics. And I'm encouraged to note that uh, this is now the decade on ecosystem restoration with yeah. the global community through the United Nations. And of course, soil is central to all of that work. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, soil is, is so remarkable. And let's just talk a little bit about what uh, you guys are doing with the certification and, and why you chose the three pillars that you chose. Okay. Yeah, that's um, it's a great starting point. So I'm the, so lucky to be the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance. You've had several 
uh, founding members from the ROA on your podcast. You had some great interviews with my dear brother, David Bronner and Garo and Jeff Moyer. And, um, you know, these are the founders of the ROA along with the Patagonia company, Patagonia, and not just the clothing, but they've also got a food brand. And so these four founders or three really Patagonia, Rodale and Bronner's um, came together and created the regenerative organic certified framework because they were concerned about what they saw as kind of um, a weakening of the organic, kind of the way organic was being implemented on the ground, a weakening of the standard. There was this allowance for uh, hydroponics, which was a huge deal within that sector in 2017. On top of um, the Trump administration had removed any provisions for animal welfare from the organic program. So therefore you, we were ending up with kind of more factory style farms in the livestock realm for organic. And um, yeah, there were just a lot of different concerns that were kind of coming up, bubbling up around a weakening of the organic standards. So the founders came together and they were like, all right, wait a minute. We love organic. We believe in organic. It's the highest label out there. It's the highest designation you can earn as a farmer. It's a lot of work many times, but we want to add to that. We want to add on these additional provisions around soil health and around animal welfare. And then also a really important and often overlooked critical component is the humans who work in these systems. So they added this social fairness pillar to the framework. And um, this is meant to ensure fair treatment to farmers and to farm workers. And so those three pillars are the central tenets of the program, soil health and land management practices, animal welfare, and then fairness to farmers and farm workers. And can you tell us a bit about some of the farmers and ranchers that you're already working with? And I, I know that you've got not only uh, the incredible accomplishment of putting this certification together. And that is no small feat. And maybe we can dive into some of the details of the framework in a moment. But now you're in the process of implementation. And uh, I imagine there's uh, a long line of farmers and ranchers who would like to get this certification. You know, what does that look like? You know, sort of boots on the ground and behind the scene. Yeah. We are super busy. We have been busy since the day I started. <laughs> it's never slowed down and I keep getting to grow my team and get more people, but we seem busier every time. I don't know. I keep thinking like, okay, we're going to finally catch up now. Um, we're not because I think everybody wants this. Everybody is reaching for this kind of ideal of something that would, um, you know, that they can really feel good about in their purchases. And I, I think one thing like just, just to, kind of set that stage around agriculture as a huge problem in this world. Uh, it contributes like up to 25, 30% of industrial kind of emissions, greenhouse gases, but agriculture also has this huge potential to be a solution. And so how do we make this, how do we help farmers get along this journey and farmers implement these practices and then consumers learn to recognize and reward these farmers and pay the premiums that they deserve those are all kind of really important aspects of this. The Rodale Institute has been looking at regenerative organic farming for quite some time. In fact, Jeff Moyer is the CEO and ED there at Rodale. And he founded this, I, this concept around the roller crimper. Long, like, I can't remember. I saw him first speak about that, Aaron, at the conference we were talking about where we're going to see each other in January, the EcoFarm conference. So I saw Jeff speak about that roller crimper there. And it's just a really, um, there's some fascinating work being done on the ground as far as implementing new regenerative practices. There's a whole contingent up north and west of you up there in the Dakotas and Nebraska um, who have been doing a lot of incorporation of regenerative practices. And so um, we really have to start there. And we start with like, how do farmers adopt these practices? A lot, a lot to be learned, um, but the, basic principles, if you want me to outline some of those principles really um, aligned with the regenerative, the more kind of general regenerative movement is minimal soil disturbance, 
You keep the ground covered at all times so that precious soil doesn't blow away. You keep living roots in the ground as long as possible or like vegetative cover on the ground, a little armor, a protective armor for that soil. You incorporate diversity into the soil, into your planting scheme and um, support biodiversity in that way. You bring animals back into the farm and bring animal manures into the farm and grazing and all the kind of benefits that that can bring. To land. So those are just some of the key principles uh, for generative. So I'm sorry if I rambled on that, but no, it's really great. And I'm uh, scribbling some notes here, uh, you know, trying to keep up to do this summary in the show notes when when we're finished. Um, that that is great to hear, and it helps uh, paint a picture of what's happening on the farms. And I, I was curious. Um, I know many of our audience are familiar with this term regenerative, but I was hoping you could. A, define it for us, and also B, speak to the potential risks we're seeing of of that term itself uh, being watered down if we don't have robust uh, certifications like the ROC. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. I think that's a really important part of this, like the intentions of the founders was, number one, like they put, they established regenerative organic certified and they link regenerative to organic. And that's key. And that is putting a stake in the ground, keeping organic from being further weakened. And also to protect the term regenerative, the founders were really concerned about this potential greenwashing from corporate interests. And they wanted to create this high bar standard that would demonstrate and clarify what regenerative can and should be. And this is a holistic type of agriculture that regenerates resources and considers all players in the farming system from the soil microbiome, to the animals, to the workers. So we believe regenerative and organic always go together. And um, this this is just something I think that is hugely important right now. And we're seeing already in three years since I've been in this position, we now have very large corporate interests. Everybody's excited about this concept of regenerative and it's becoming a buzzword. And it's potentially getting weakened when we see that Walmart wants to be a regenerative business. What does that mean? And when people are claiming regenerative, by whose definition? What is, you know, and so this is something where the founders put this framework out, got public comment, 400 public comments came in. And and that's when they were like, oh, boy, we're onto something. And they hired NSF International to be the program manager and NSF took, um, they are an international standards bearer. They have like 165 different standards they implement around the globe. So they came in and they were brought on, this is before I was hired, they were the program manager and they took in all that feedback. They worked with all these different task forces and advisory groups on deliberating and through that feedback, made recommendations to a second version of the framework. The first version that came out said no till. And as you can imagine, you're familiar with farming and farmers were all like, what do you mean no till? That's not going to work. So we want minimal till or conservation till, but no till isn't practical. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, feedback and critical feedback that was incorporated and addressed and built into that new second version. That's about when I came along and we then did the pilot program. And so I may be getting ahead of myself, so I won't go into the pilot. Maybe you want to talk about that in a bit, but just you know, as far as the term regenerative agriculture, this term was actually first um, introduced by George Washington Carver. Mm. And then it was popularized by Robert Rodeo. It was made pretty well, most well-known people, we think perhaps because Rodale's our founder, but it was made more well-known by Robert Rodeo. And um, it's a collection of practices that focus on regenerative soil health and the full farm ecosystem. And I just want to acknowledge that these practices, they come from traditional and indigenous practices that have been stewarding land for millennia around the globe. And so, um, you know, I don't want to underestimate that contribution or make it seem like this, you know, the some modern concept. It's really old ways of farming. So what's old is new. Yeah, it's, it's, I thank you for acknowledging that and mentioning that. And you know, I, th- I think one of the one of the keys here that um, not everybody has a full appreciation for quite yet is the degree to which we have toxified our agricultural soils and and the waters being used to irrigate those soils. 
Right. And, you know, this is this is one of the linkages that has not only created massive dead zones, thousands upon thousands of acres of dead zones at the river deltas, the Mississippi and other Mm -hmm. great rivers around the world. But increasingly, the medical community is linking this toxification to our own cancers and other Mm -hmm. uh, severe diseases and ailments. And so, you know, there's not only the, the, the climate imperative and the biodiversity imperative, but this is very much about our own human health and wellness, right? Totally. Food as medicine. You know, there's um, food can be our medicine and should be. And we, um, you know, we, we have an epidemic here of diabetes and heart disease, all these diet related illnesses that we suffer here in the West and and particularly in North America, I, you know, these are a result of our reliance on our our concept that or belief that we deserve cheap food, that we have a right to cheap food. Number one, that one, I'm sorry, I people may differ with me on that, but I just like, I really don't believe in cheap food. Farmers should be paid, it costs money to grow food and, and to tend to food in this way. And we have this false concept of like, oh, we should have dollar dozen eggs and we should have all this abundance of corn and soy, which is used as just processing. It's just processed foods. And so um, cheap food is definitely not better. Everybody deserves access to healthy quality fruits and vegetables and good grains and not like these massive kind of the the winter wheat the soft winter wheat that a lot of people are developing the the um gluten they have problems with the gluten and digesting that same with the milks the dairy that is mass produced same with the corn all these people with diabetes like these are all a result of the way we're eating and the way we're producing our food so yeah it's a bit of a um probably a um a bit of a soapbox that I can try and step off of right now. Yeah, no, it's it's so important to connect these dots. And I had the opportunity to interview a brilliant young lady who happens to be my daughter about uh, mm-hmm. illness uh, as yeah. seen through the eyes of the medical community. And, and she said that basically all illness boils down to inflammation and toxicity. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that <laughs> what we've yeah. got going on, especially in this country, is a super toxic uh, food supply that is also highly inflammatory in, in many cases. So we're, we're sort of getting the double whammy here, especially in the United States. Have you seen the new book, Inflamed? I've seen it. I haven't read yeah. it yet, though. Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. So Raj Patel, of course, probably most people know. And Rupa is an amazing doctor. And as, as she calls herself, farmer's wife. Um, she's right here in the Bay area and she and her husband, I've known him a long time, um, an amazing farmer, and they're doing some really amazing work here with some other farming kind of ventures. He's doing the, um, farm, the rooftop, and they're doing a lot of fantastic work around this whole concept of helping, um, indigenous people come back to their land and farm traditional foods. And yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. There's also Daphne Miller down in San Francisco. She's done a lot of work on this um, topic. I don't know if you know of her. I actually do not at this point. So it would be fun to connect with her. Oh yeah. She's great. Um, let me look and see what her book was. I, I It's pharmacopoeia. I read oh, it ago. Pharmacopoeia with an F. Yeah. And she did a lot. Of, she learned a lot from working with, um, you know, a lot of farm workers who Rupa and Daphne both working with farm workers who were exposed to the toxic pesticides that you just were talking about. And we're talking about those dead zones. And, you know, you all are keenly aware of water issues there, Colorado, what happens to that water as it keeps going down further down river and getting more and more runoff goes to it. And then it gets more concentrated by the time it gets down South. It's like just a trickle of toxic soup and who can grow food on that. And so there's an equity issue that is just so apparent to some of us and so not apparent to others. It's really challenging to think about solutions to that, but. Yes. Yeah, truly. We've got a lot of work to do. Your comment about cheap food made me think of some statistics I came across a few years back that really uh, shed some light on the situation. And 
goes something like this. Uh, here in the United States, we spend apparently only somewhere around 5% yeah. of our GDP on food and something yeah. more like 15 to 20% on healthcare. Yes. And in many other parts of the world, I'm remembering French statistics. Um, it's actually the the inverse, right? 15 yeah, yeah, yeah. percent on food and more like 5% on health. Thanks for that reminder. Yeah, I forgot about that statistic. It's really super revealing, right? Like, yeah. And look at our healthcare costs, and look at what's going on in healthcare. And I think um, I think it's Zach Bush or, or, or Farmers Footprint who talks about this, like the trillion dollars that we spend on healthcare. Like, what if we just spent it on good quality food and and grew, you know made healthier people? Exactly right. Exciting, yeah. There's a lot of opportunities for us to turn this around. That's the thing that I, I feel like your message and what I get from your work, Aaron, and why on earth and what you and your community have been doing, like, let's look to the hopeful solutions. What do we need to do? Turn this around. And so, you know, there's things that are very impactful, very evident. We don't have to prove the science on this. We know it. It's been proven. So let's just go. Let's make it happen, right? Yeah, I love this, Elizabeth. And, and you know, I think one of the secrets that hopefully is getting out more and more is that those of us who are fortunate enough to be already engaged in this kind of lifestyle in the communities of incredible farmers and leaders yeah. who are forging the way here you know there is a there is a quality of life experience thing that we get to enjoy and i remember when you visited elk run farm just a few weeks ago yeah. And we said, let's not record a podcast quite yet. Let's just hang out and chat. It was so fun. You know, it's so fun. And, and before you took off, we had traded all kinds of <laughs> ferments. And you gave me this amazing uh, uh, powder of uh, beneficial yeah. herbs and roots and, and fungi that I've been using in my smoothies. And oh, nice. you some things. And, and it's there, there's this, this cultural experience that I think... Yeah our ancestors all had in their life ways, but we've really lost in this modern industrial society of ours. And mm -hmm. I think one of the real silver linings in all of this is we get to not only restore soil and water, but also restore our own quality of life, basically. Yeah, yeah that's really beautiful. And it's so true. Like that exchange is just really, um, it, it's so powerful. And so, um, so gratifying to just kind of like roaming through your your cabinets. <laughs> like, wow, look at all this stuff. This is amazing. Uh, it was really fun. And your art and all your books. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the mulberry shrub. How's that going? So well. I'm enjoying <laughs> everything that you shared. Good, good. good. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I'm um I'm curious if if you could maybe tell us just a little bit more about your partners, and I know you mentioned some of um, the three founding partners, but you've also shared with me a number of other organizations who are involved in, in the work you're doing, and it might be nice to do a bit of a, a kind of survey and shout out to them if you would like. Totally. Yes. Gosh. So we have the other members of our board, amazing uh, organizations doing some phenomenal work. There's Textile Exchange. And so like there's, there's a huge level of interest coming in from textile world. And so I feel like you and I are mostly talking about food, farming for food, but oh my gosh, the potentials with textiles and the interest coming in from fashion sector is way up here. And yeah. so um, that's some really cool stuff. And now you want to think about cotton, hemp, um, wool, cashmere, hides from leather. Um, so there's, there's a, a ton of potential there and a lot of um, from high fashion to fast fashion. The fashion industry is really turning it around and looking at itself and like, whoa, this is a very dirty, polluting industry. And I think there's a lot of changes happening and that's been pretty exciting to see. So we've got the textile exchange represented. We've also got compassion in world farming, amazing, um, really knowledgeable, technically kind of super knowledgeable, folks there who are helping us navigate the um, the animal welfare standards and find a way to let farmers, of course, raise livestock and incorporate livestock onto the farm, but being reasonable about it and, um, you know, ensuring that animals who are going to be farmed and raised for meat, that they get 
uh, I know it's a little bit ironic, but that they have a really high quality of life. Their entire life lets them live and express their natural behaviors up until that one last bad day, as my former board member, Will Harris, always said. The one, the last bad day, the only bad day they had was that day, you know, when they got to the slaughterhouse. We also have um, David Bronner as a leader and a, a longtime vegan. And, um, you know, he's a huge advocate for, for veganism, for less, better meat. And so that is infused throughout a lot of our work. Um, yeah, so we have Others Fair World Project and Dana Geffner advocates on behalf of farm workers all over. She's doing a lot of work with the dairy sector here domestically and has always done um, global work. And um, then we have a new board member who I am just so gaga over is Ade Romero Briones. And um, she is from First Nations and she runs um, their sustainable food program and does a lot of work around food sovereignty for indigenous peoples. And, um, and she also was a former NOSB member. So she knows the law. She's a, trained as a lawyer, was formerly a judge. She's just phenomenal. And, um, and then Paul Dolan, another member of our board, he is, has always been a real leader in the wine grape growing sector. And we've had a lot of interest coming in from wine. Um, and so Paul was the leader who took the Fetzer wine label, Fetzer company to organic in the nineties. And then he went even further from there, went ended up in biodynamics and he just keeps evolving. And so he's gone from the organic to biodynamic to now regenerative organic. And he's the chair of my board. I think I caught everybody. Oh no, Alfred Grant. We have a farmer in Europe. Um, and he's on the um, EU Commission Board for Soil Health. He's a, an infectious farmer, crazy for worms and soil and all kinds of good things. Um, I think that rounds out my board. And then I, what you and I were talking about were some of our recently certified entities. And I was talking to you about Poconos Organic. I had just been out to visit them and they're just um, a ray of light in, in this uh, work and um, really am amazing folks committed to food as medicine. Um, the founders uh, there, the founder of uh, Pocono Organics had some health challenges that she was able to address by changing her whole eating style into an organic and now regenerative organic kind of lifestyle. And she's a big advocate for that. And Pocono is, this is the family, this is the Pocono raceway. Okay. Like, I don't know if you ever watched NASCAR. I personally didn't. Um, and I don't, but um, my dad raced NASCAR. Really? And, yeah. And, and my dad was also an NFL football player. And af after his football career, he was racing cars. And when I was home, after I saw you, I was in Georgia and I had to go bury my, my sweet dad that, you know, after losing him last year. But my brother was like, well, Elizabeth, dad raced at Pocono. That was where I was with him in that picture where I was wiping his head off. And it was kind of cool because I had no idea that my dad was at that racetrack where I was just the week before. Um, but anyway, that's, I, that's a side, definitely segue. Um, Pocono Organics doing amazing work. And um, I had just been to visit our friends at Organic India there in Boulder. And they have just recently become allies of the ROA. And they've got a, a couple of different farms in India in the, um, that they're applying for rock. And so, you know, I, I hope to see some certified organic Tulsi tea from them in the coming year. And they're just amazing folks. They're going to be opening up a really cool flagship store there on Pearl Street in Boulder. Um, I, I'll probably be out there to visit when they open in January. So I expect to see you there. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll have yeah. to celebrate for sure. Yeah, they're going to do some really great events there, like educational events around um you know, healing of herbs and um, different aspects of that and all around regenerative organic. And yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a really neat shop. That is so cool. Yeah. Let me ask, you know, as consumers, as all of this is growing in scale and scope, what is it we can be doing as consumers to help support all of this? And where can we find, you know, the, the, food companies and and fashion and clothing companies who already have the certification yeah that's a great question so one of the last emails i had tonight was from my wonderful certification manager and she's working in our database on getting this um almost 
ready for um, publishing. We hope we're expecting before like we leave for the Christmas holiday uh -huh. um, that we are going to have the rock search directory live and running on our website. So you can go there and type in a type of commodity and you can get a search engine to show you where you can get those types of crops or um, you know where those farms are located so that might not necessarily mean you can walk to the store and buy that product right next year the second iteration of our farmer directory will include brands and products that are on the market cool. so that's one thing um i would point you and your friends to our instagram page where we just did this we had a whole series of tiles we kind of like after my trip across the Midwest and seeing all that corn and soy, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, it just felt like so desperate crossing those beautiful prairies that have been converted to GMO corn and soy. And this is awful. And so we did this whole like disturbing content post and we got a lot of interest and a lot of people saying, oh my God, what can I do? <laughs> so we did a whole series of posts of what can I do as a farmer? What can I do as a brand? What can I do as a consumer? So there's like 10 different things on each of those um, posts. So. Please. That is great. Okay. And yeah. if you want, I can say some of them out loud right now. If you want, I'm just, I just Please. opened it up. Yeah, let's do it. That's um, great. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So as a consumer, first of all, um, to buy from farmers, mm -hmm. that's the first thing is, you know, buy direct, go to your farmers and get, you know, be in touch with your farmer and buy direct and ask them how they farm, right? We don't want to assume that they don't farm in ways that we would value. And so, um, I just think, you know, having the conversation is really important. Um, also asking of your retailers and your brands that they are carrying these types of products. Like it's um, Patagonia had a great ad campaign recently too, that was like demand more, mm -hmm. demand more from your brands and consume less by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, that's, that's another one. And um, just educate yourself. There's so many resources. There's so many ways to, to support this movement, to learn about the movement, the Kiss the Ground folks, they've got a great soil advocacy training. They're about to embark on a really cool project that we'll be helping with. Um, we're gonna try and you know, help any way we can is regenerate America. And it's gonna be all about the next farm bill. And so that farm bill, you know, we have this historic opportunity to influence change for this upcoming farm bill. The farm bill, is why people eat this, this crappy food here in this country because of SNAP, because of the food stamps that drives people to purchase really cheap food that isn't good for them. And so like getting more provisions in that farm bill to help people access healthy fruits and vegetables and help farmers to support farmers to access the land for marginalized farmers to access land. There are so many ways that we can turn the farm bill around so that it is not just one giant sucking subsidy for Monsanto and Cargill and all of the massive corporations who have like 1400 lobbyists in Washington, DC. They get all the money. They've got all the lobbyists. They get all the money. And so the consumers, people need to step up, speak out and get that farm bill turned around. And so that is gonna be a great opportunity in the coming year to really activate on that. So that's, um, those are a couple of tangible things as a consumer. That is super helpful. Let me uh, take advantage of this as a segue too, uh, to say that your Instagram handle is at Regenerative Organic and folks can also get a lot of additional information at your website, which is regenorganic.org. And we'll have these links in the show notes. I yeah. wanna take a quick moment to just remind our audience, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with the Executive Director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance, Elizabeth Whitlow. And want to give a, a huge shout out to our uh, supporters who make this podcast series possible. And this includes Earth Coast Productions, the Lidge Family Foundation, Purium, Earth Hero, Vera Herbals, Growing Spaces, Soilworks, Joyful Journey Hot Springs Spa, Earth Water Press, Dr. Bronner's, and Ecoversity. And of course, uh, Waylay Waters is also a supporter. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, individual supporter program that you can join as a listener. Go to whyonearth.org uh, support. 
and sign up at any level that works for you uh, on a monthly basis. And if you would like to sign up at the $33 level, uh, Waylay Waters will send you a jar of the regeneratively grown uh, hemp infused organic coconut oil aromatherapy soaking salt as a thank you gift. So that's um, part of the win-win-win uh, regenerative uh, economic relationships we like to build in the movement. And of course, just want to invite you again to like, subscribe, and follow on YouTube and on uh, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. That's all very appreciated. And uh, yeah, Elizabeth, I guess, you know, we've got uh, in the coming year a lot of very exciting uh, things on on deck and getting onto the docket, so to speak. In addition to the farm bill, are there other initiatives and campaigns that that you're aware of and that you're plugged into that you think we should know about? Mm. Um, the American Sustainable Business Council does a really great job with this. Um, I, you know, they um, definitely keep up with policy and upcoming policy uh, bills to vote on and. I, you know, I think the biggest one right now is that we just passed was this infrastructure bill and let's see how that goes. Um, but there's, there was initially a lot in there um, to be happy about from Cory Booker and from others in this space. Um, so I'm not sure how much of that was intact. I kind of lost track of it and all the, oh my gosh. <laughs> all the machinations. Oh right? gosh, yeah. All the, all the uh, sausage making as people. Wow. Yeah, that was horrifying to see that sausage making. But yeah, it, it did make it. And now let's see how it does with them um, when it gets to the Senate. But um, yeah, that's American Sustainable Business Council has they do some great work on that. So if you're not involved with them, that might be a good resource for you. That's great. Yeah. You know, and I, I want to share with folks, too, that uh, you, you were just on this really amazing tour uh, driving all around the country, visiting all sorts of different farms and organizations. And I was wondering if you might just tell us a little bit about your adventures. Yeah. It, um, and, and we're actually posting a bunch on our Insta about it. And actually, I wanted to also tell your folks if they wanted to get more information and learn more about Regenerative, we're developing out some really great resources. And if you sign up on our mailing list, we'll send you a series, like three or four like the welcome email and then like some other emails with some great resources and reading material and suggestions for how to educate yourself more about regenerative organic and about these practices and what's going on um, all over the world. And that's the really exciting thing too, Aaron, is this is so global. It's actually, we're probably busier on the international front than we are domestically. And we're really busy domestically. So <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so some of the highlights of my trip, I mean, Honestly, one thing I really, I had some reservations feeling like, okay, here I come with California plates, driving around the country in this big van and people like were so politicized and people are so angry that nobody's going to be nice to me, you mm -hmm. know, or like people aren't going to be very welcoming, especially maybe like this West coast, left coast kind of liberal coming into the center of the country where things, people are more traditional and in fact, I just found quite the opposite. I found just such a warm reception and so much kind of graciousness and kindness. And I was just really, um, it, it just kind of filled my heart in a lot of ways um, in, in that. And visiting these farms was fantastic. People really, really need to see each other. And that I felt everywhere I went, we were all just like, you couldn't get enough of like having visitors and having people on site to see the farm and talk about what they were doing because we've all been operating in this vacuum and, you know, gosh, let's hope that we're going to be coming out of it this year, but um, who knows who can predict. Um, but yeah, those were some of the highlights, um, some really innovative farms and cool stuff happening. That was great to see on the ground. I was hit at about the most perfect time. It was really harvest time and colors were changing. And by the time I left you and was heading West, actually from you, I went down to Denver and we had this workshop with, um, we did a training for, for NOP auditors. I think that was after I saw you, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it yeah, yeah. was. Tell us what NOP stands for. Just oh, Sorry, me and I, my neck acronyms in this industry. Uh, National Organic Program. 
Yeah. So that's a federal law that oversees and, and tells us how organic works. And then there are certifiers who do that work. And so all the certifiers, any of the certifiers that we are working with at the Regenerative Organic Alliance, we have this whole new territory, which I spoke of earlier, the social fairness component of our pillar. And typically the organic auditors have really in this in domestically don't have any expertise in this topic. If you go to the global south or go to the international front where organic auditors are all very accustomed to doing organic and fair trade audits at the same time, because that is like it's been developing for 30 years in places where we see human trafficking and child labor and all kinds of horrific things more commonly. So here domestically, it's more hidden, it's in the shadows and it's not as, as obvious to people that these things are happening right here under our nose. People are like, oh, but we have employment law, we have OSHA, but actually that doesn't protect the most vulnerable among us. It doesn't protect the undocumented individuals who make up 65% of our agricultural labor. So the social fairness component is really key in helping auditors learn how to approach an audit. In like, it's a, it, it was a very trauma-based approach to auditing, trauma-based tr kind of training. And we did it in Denver with a wonderful group, Equitable Food Initiative, and their trainer from Chile, who um, works with horses a lot. And so we did part of our training at an equine, equine assisted um, facility for uh, rescue horses. And it was really all about body language and learning the importance of, of reading like um, the body language of somebody who has been traumatized in some way or another and learning how to be sensitive to that and how to handle it. And, in a way that doesn't further endanger them. And so, yeah, it was a really uh, powerful couple of days there that we spent together. And, um, and then from there, after the training, I just was heading west. Yeah, yeah. Back, back to the west coast, back to home. And how far east did you get on your trip? Uh, well, I got to, um, I drove all the way to Georgia, but then I ended up leaving my little dog who you met. She wasn't loving the trip. So I left her in Georgia and I went up to um, Pennsylvania. I flew up there to get to Rodeo Institute and then to Poconos. Okay. Then I came back and drove the van up to Indiana and then started back across the country, visited some um, really cool spots in um, the Dakotas and in um, in Iowa at the Rodeo Midwest Center. And um, yeah. That's wonderful. Cool. Sounds like such a cool adventure. And it was really fun to be able to be a part of your kind of final stretch there. You know, and part of one of my other highlights I could just share is because yeah. it's really where I got my start in agriculture was way too long ago. Um, back in the early 90s, I was at the Prairie Institute or the Land Institute for the Prairie Festival. And that's yeah. um, in Kansas. And so um, I was really struck by the work that Wes Jackson was doing then. And still so like um, just revere that man and his work and the work that's happening at the Land Institute. And so um, it's interesting how this whole thing kind of came around full circle for me because I also have always been a long admirer of Yvonne Chouinard and Yvonne Chouinard was the one who got a hold of the Kerns of Grain and took it to, <coughs> excuse me, to provisions and said, ask Birgit, like, let's do something with this. And that's when they decided to make long root ale. I have something in my throat, just a minute. Sure. <clears throat> you okay? I think I'm gonna live. Good. <laughs> a little water. A little, a little tea, a little tea to get me through. It's the end of day here, almost six o'clock. Um, it's dark there too. You're oh yeah. Your evening hour. Yep, indeed, yeah. Well, I am just so happy, Elizabeth, that we could connect and record our conversation for our podcast audience. And before we sign off, I just want to make sure to give you the floor if there's anything else you'd like to say to our audience in general or any specific calls to action you might uh, want to add to what you've already shared with us. Gosh, I mean, I, I feel like I've been talking a lot um, and I would just say, like, you know, please learn what you can learn as much as you can about this movement and support farmers who are incorporating these methods, help farmers get on the tra trajectory so that they can get to this type of farming. It does take a lot. Farmers are operating at very thin margins 
and there's a lot of volatility in it. Not only do you are you at the whims of like nature and climate change, floods and fires and all kinds of things, but then you've got the market over here. And so it's really tough, tough road to hoe. So support your local farmer, learn as much as you can to support those farmers, support the ROA if you like what we're doing. Um, gosh, we're a nonprofit and we could always use more support. And when you support us, we support them. And so, you know, just, yeah, feel free, learn more about us. And I think I'll just leave it at that, Aaron. And thank you. I can't wait. Um, can't wait for the next. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, you can cut me off. I'm not supposed to talk about it. No, we, we're, we can say goodbye and, uh, your book. Uh, you're, this is a great teaser for our audience. I don't know where you're going with this. Oh, I was going to ask about the thing that I'm so excited that's going to be coming out from you. Oh yeah, we can talk. We can talk about that in vague terms. That's a great teaser, actually. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. That's what I'm excited about, and I'm excited about seeing you in January. So I'm going to send you the conference, um, the schedule, just to entice you further. You. Make sure, you get signed up. Yeah, so Elizabeth is referring to, I, I know some of you know this, we'll be talking more and more about this in the next few months. Uh, I just finished writing an epic eco-techno thriller novel about these times that we're living in. And there are some really exciting revelations and calls to action and so on. And Elizabeth and I were talking a little about this before we started recording today. So um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a blast to drop a lot of teasers in the next few months and then finally mm -hmm. share the book with folks in the springtime when it's published. Um, but yeah, Elizabeth, and it, it's so wonderful being connected with you and having already planted many seeds for collaboration, knowing that, you know, there's so much more work to do and that we get to enjoy collaborating and uh, creating together. Thank you. There is so much to do, so much to be done. And I know we're going to get to do it together. I love that. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much for your good work. Thanks. I want to do the, I want to do the why on earth kind of like YMCA thing, but I've got the backdrop on. So I think my arms disappear. <laughs> love it. We'll, we'll figure something out there too. We'll create a dance. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Elizabeth, talk thank to you. you so much. We'll see you around. Bye. Bye-bye. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code Why on Earth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.